Call the third case on this morning's docket, case number 113228, State of Kansas v. DeQuantrius Johnson. May it please the court and counsel, Assistant District Attorney Matt Maloney for the state, and I'd like to request two minutes for rebuttal. That is granted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, as a brief factual basis for this case, we are here on a criminal appeal in a case in which the defendant was convicted of criminal possession of a firearm, aggravated assault, and criminal discharge of a firearm at the district court level. Uh, the facts underlying the actual crimes are not relevant to the issues on appeal. Uh, what is relevant is the fact that on the second day of trial, a juror brought to the judge's assistant's attention the fact that this juror had noticed that on the first afternoon of trial, the judge appeared to have uh, nodded off at some point. The court then addressed the matter with the other jurors and with the attorneys and the defendant. Um, acknowledged that he did temporarily, briefly nod off, noted that um, there had not been any uh, objections or anything else that he failed to rule on during that time, but he then specifically offered defense counsel and the defendant the opportunity to move for a mistrial. The defense declined to do so and said that they were ready to proceed to with the trial, and then ultimately the defendant was convicted of all charges. Uh, on appeal to the Court of Appeals, a majority of the panel found that the judge uh, nodding off during trial is structural error and therefore automatically requires reversal without any showing of prejudice. Counsel? Yes. Does the record tell us anything about how long the judge was asleep? Uh, not in specifics. Uh, what, what it does show is that the judge himself, I think, referred to it as briefly nodding off. Okay. Um, he did not say um, wh whether briefly meant five seconds or a minute. Um, and that sort of dovetails with one of the first reasons that I disagree with the majority's opinion. And, and first, let me say right off, the state does not in any way want to give the impression that we don't think that it's error or that we think it's not that big of a deal. We recognize it's clearly error and it is important. And for that reason, it should be scrutinized. Our position, though, is that contrary to what the majority concluded, this is not something that, in the words of the panel, obviously defies harmless error analysis. The statement that it obviously defies harmless error analysis is at odds with what numerous courts have held. In his dissent, Judge Boozer cited numerous federal and state courts that have addressed the very issue of a judge falling asleep during a criminal trial and have held that prejudice must be shown, that it is not structural. Can Our, you explain to me if um, I understand that to be your position and I understand the support that's cited by Judge Boozer, um, how is a sleeping judge unlike an absent judge? Sure. I think there are two or three ways that come immediately to mind. First would be the fact that how, how simple or difficult it is to remedy the issue. If a judge nods off for a couple of seconds, it's much easier for somebody in the courtroom, be it a bailiff, an administrative assistant, somebody can, if they so choose, immediately do something about it. They can get, call the judge's name, they could tap the judge on the shoulder, and immediately the situation would be remedied. Obviously, if a judge is not in the courtroom, that's not an option. Another difference is that a judge who's absent from the courtroom, that's obvious to everybody there. The jury, everybody is going to see that and it's going to send and give an impression that the judge does not consider what's happening to be significant. Whereas a sleeping judge, especially if it's brief, the jurors might not even notice it and it might not send any signal to them about the relative importance of what's happening. And I think this case bears out that there was only one juror who apparently saw this. Well, we don't know that, do we? I mean, well, we, I get, we you're correct. We, don't, we know that there was only one juror that mentioned it. I want to let you make 
finish making your list about the differences. Sure. But the two that you've mentioned so far um, don't apply necessarily here because the first is that someone can do something immediately. That didn't happen. But that has nothing to do with whether the error is structural, and that, that ties into my main point today, which well, is Well, you're that making a theoretical argument is all I'm pointing out. Do you have anything else on your list about how a sleeping judge is unlike an absent judge? Sure. I, I think the other thing, and, and I found this in a case just within the past few days. It's not a Kansas case, and, and so I, I'm not citing it for its authority, but I think it makes a logical point, which is that part of the reason to have structural error, to apply structural error, error would be to discourage judges from behaving in this type of behavior. And clearly a judge that chooses to leave the bench during trial, to take a phone call, to do whatever it is that he or she is doing, that's intentional behavior that can easily be um, deterred, discouraged deterred. by having stru structural error analysis. Whereas falling asleep in the, in, during a trial is I think we can safely conclude something that a judge does not do on purpose. And so structural error is not going to discourage or have any effect on the likelihood of that type of thing happening. But what about the, I'm sorry, Go ahead. what about the part of the earlier argument when a judge gets up and leaves that demonstrates, as you said to people in the courtroom, the judge did not think what was happening was important. Right. Can the same thing be said about a judge who falls asleep? In other words, I don't need to pay attention to this. I'm just going to take a little nap. I understand falling asleep sometimes is involuntary, but is that, is that not also sending the same message to people, particularly the jury, when they say, well, if the judge not, is not paying attention, then I don't need to pay attention. I think that if a juror notices the judge nodding off, uh, obviously it's not... It's not sending a good message to the juror, but I think that a juror would likely recognize that far more likely than the judge simply not thinking that the proceeding is important would be that most people would interpret that and realize that it's, it's involuntary. It was not something done because he didn't think it was important, but rather he was tired. He nodded off. He fell asleep. I think most people have experienced that enough in their own lives, whether it be at their own jobs or in other settings where they're clearly not trying to fall asleep and they're not falling asleep because they don't consider what they're doing important but just because they're temporarily overcome by the need to, to nod off i guess and if, this, and if this were structural error we would not get into the inquiry on the facts here which is the judge fell asleep during the state's presentation of the evidence, correct? It was Yes, it was either during the state's presentation of the evidence um, or the, the two things that we know happened during that first afternoon um, were the, uh, the court concluded for Dyer and then the first witness who happened to be the, the complaining witness testified, um, both direct and cross-examination. So it was at some point during that. Um, portion of the trial. So we don't know if the judge fell asleep during the cross-examination. We don't, and, and that leads directly into the point that I want to most strongly make here today, which is that to the extent that the panel in this particular case thought that the record, thought that it was difficult to determine or impossible to determine prejudice because there was not enough clarity with respect to when and for how long the judge slept, that is not that difficulty is not due to the inherent nature of the error, i.e. the judge sleeping. It's due to the fact that the defense, as the appellant who has the burden to designate a record showing prejudicial error, the defense chose to make no efforts to develop a record about this. Not only did the defense expressly deny the judge's um, offer or question about whether they wanted to move for a mistrial, but they didn't even suggest that the court needed to make a more sufficient, thorough record of this. Clearly, had the defense done wanted to do so, there were a lot of avenues that would have been available for the court. The court could have brought that juror in and said, okay, how long, when did you see me nodding off? Was this during the examination of the witness? Was it during a break? Perhaps it was when the attorney was going to get the witness from Chambers. Perhaps it was while co-counsel were sitting at table conferring for five seconds over a, an exhibit that they were preparing to admit. Uh, perhaps it was during Vordire. 
They could have also asked the juror, how long did you notice me sleeping? Was it for five seconds? Did, did my head simply bob down and I was right back awake? Or was I asleep for the entirety of well, this witness's testimony? We understand all the number of questions that could be asked, but I'm not sure I accept your premise. Isn't the state, as well as the trial judge, um, charged with at least a certain amount of responsibility to provide a fair trial? I think the court, clearly the court, every defendant is due to is, is entitled to a fair trial. I, I don't know how the state in the courtroom. So why 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 is this the fault of the defense? The the judge falling asleep is not the fault of the defense. The defense's fault was that they had an opportunity to. No, why is it that we don't know when this happened? The fault of the defense, if the judge recognized that something happened because of what he did um, that impaired the fairness of the trial, what, why wasn't it up, up to the judge and the prosecution to ascertain the extent of the unfairness? Why is it up to the defense to, to uh, fix the judge's error? Well, first, you're, you're assuming in that question that it did prejudice the defendant's right to a fair trial. We don't know that. Second of all, I would say that if the state were the one on appeal trying to argue that there was a problem with this, then we would be the ones that should be held responsible for failing not to argue or to develop a record below. Um, again, the defense, you asked why the judge was, is not at fault for failing to develop a record. The judge made that offer and specifically said, and I think Judge Boozer, judge Boozer did an excellent job in his dissent talking about the fact that here you've got a situation where the judge offered a mistrial, or the, at least the ability to request one. And as Judge Guzer pointed out, the mistrial statute is perfectly tailored for just this type of situation. Now, obviously, not just for this type of situation. There are all sorts of things that can happen in trial that would lead to a mistrial request. But this certainly is one where the party would be able to move for a mistrial, and then there's all sorts of things that could be done, but the defense flatly refused that. And I think this is this is a situation where you can't say, well, it was just oversight. Um, I, I know recently in the context of instructional errors, there's been the new case law with respect to does invited error apply in that setting if a defendant requests an, an instruction. And this court has said, well, we need to look and see, was it something where it was just a generic request and there was no indication that it was strategy, or was it something that was deliberate and tactical? Well, here, in this context, I don't think there's any possibility that anybody could argue that it was simply oversight on the part of defense counsel. Defense are, you, are, are you arguing, counsel, that if, if we agree with you that this is not structural error, that that ends this issue because we no one has to conduct a harmlessness analysis given the invited error? Yes, our position would be that if you agree that this is not structural, then as non-structural error, invited error is always available if the facts warrant it. And our okay. position is that because the defense specifically denied that request and said, no, we want to move forward with trial, and I, that, that, that that is invited error. And I think that Judge Boozer points out in his dissent. So you don't think that we would have to, or that a remand to the Court of Appeals would be on the table? I don't think it would be necessary on the facts in this case. And I, and I think that, um, you know, again, as the dissent pointed out, what you set up if you do not apply invited error in this situation is a situation where a defense counsel easily could, for lack of a better phrase, sandbag. They could realize, okay, here's something that happened that is, that is error. There's a possibility that if I move for mistrial, the court would grant that, and we would start back over and there'd be no concerns with me getting a fair trial. But instead, I'm gonna go ahead and roll the dice and hope that my client gets acquitted I will invite that error by telling the court, no, I don't want a mistrial. I want to go forward as things stand right now. From the defense perspective, if, if we prevail and if the jury acquits us, then great. But if not, we have this built-in error. None of, the, none of that plays into the structural error analysis, does it? That's all secondary. That all comes after. Right, right, of course. If it's yes. structural, invited doesn't right. apply. Yes, if, if it is structural error, uh, then invited error is not on the table. Can, can you waive? An error if it's structural? 
if, if the defendant wanted to proceed, hey, we're winning this. The judge nodded off, fine, but hey, we're winning this trial. I don't want a mistrial. Can a defendant waive a structural error? That's a good question. I don't know that I've ever seen it phrased quite that way. And I, I guess the whole premise of structural error is that what happens is so prejudicial or th th there's simply no way to analyze whether it was prejudicial or harmless. Um, you know, I, I don't know whether a defendant would be able, if in that scenario, if, like you've pointed out, if the defense attorney and the defendant feel like things are going great and we don't, we don't want this to be declared a mistrial, we want to keep going forward. Um, could that then on appeal with the state be able to say, oh well, no, that should have been something that was, that was remedied right then. It's, it's structural error. And even if the defendant wants to, they can't waive it. I think, um, did the defense, did the defendant actually waive the problem here? And did the defendant actually say anything? It was counsel who waived in this, or it was counsel. There was a waiver, it was counsel who spoke. It was spoke, counsel right? who spoke, yes. So to the extent this implicates a jury trial, defendant personally has to waive that, right? Well, he clearly didn't waive a jury trial. He, right. He, he waived an error that occurred during the jury trial, and I don't or think there's... counsel did, yeah. This, this seems to be, we, we've had mistrial come up numerous times this week, but one of the, one of the things that would occur here is that the defense, defense counsels put it, put in the quandary as if they acquiesce or agree to a mistrial or move for a mistrial, then they waive any double jeopardy, uh, just double jeopardy claim that could arise from this. Jeopardy's attached, and if the defendant moves for a mistrial and it's granted, there's no uh, opportunity to at least address that question in terms of double jeopardy. So by this proceeding and either the court or state declaring a mistrial uh, preserves the defendant's right to, to raise a double jeopardy question. So there's that issue also. True, although I think that if, if we're going to assume that a mistrial was warranted, I, I think any time there's a mistrial declared, then obviously the, the double jeopardy issue, assuming that it was properly declared a mistrial, then double jeopardy is off the table. But I. I don't, I'm not aware of any case law saying essentially then that the defense is relieved from having to request one in the appropriate circumstances just because that would then eliminate um, a double jeopardy argument. If, if our purpose, as this court has indicated, if the, if the main concern here is ensuring a fair trial to the defendant, then in that situation, I think clearly the defense should be expected to, when offered the chance, um, move or take the court up on its offer. I'd also note, and, and this I guess is a broader issue than simply in the context of a sleeping or nodding off judge, is that I, I understand this court's case law for many years has been that uh, when there's error found that it's the, the prevailing party below is, is the party that's expected to show that it's harmless error. Uh, I do just logically, take some issue with the assumption that because a party ultimately prevails at trial, that they were somehow the beneficiary of the error. Um, it's just as possible that something that happens during the trial could be harmful to the state, even though the state ultimately prevails with respect to the verdict. I don't know how anybody could say that a judge nodding off during a portion of the trial helps either party. Um, again, I acknowledge that if this court were to find that harmless error analysis applies, it is our burden to show that that error was in fact harmless. But I think that also takes, you have to, to get there, you have to determine whether the defense as the appellant has designated a sufficient burden. If, if the, uh, a sufficient record to show prejudicial error. And here our position is that because the defense not only didn't request a mistrial, but because they didn't ask the court to bring in all of the jurors, even question the attorneys, the bailiff, you've got no, numerous people in the courtroom. And it would have been very, very easy to determine. And, and that's Counsel, where I- Counsel, I'm just gonna interrupt you. Sure. Um, I apologize for that, but no. you're, you're out of time and have been out of time for a while, but I did want to give you just a brief minute to address the jury trial waiver sure. issue. Uh, and just I'll just cut right to the chase. Why wasn't the Court of Appeals wrong to 
not apply the more recent case law from this court? Because that recent case law is not on point, whereas the case law that the Court of Appeals and that I relied on in my brief is. The case that the Court of Appeals, uh, the, the more recent case law had to do with an evidentiary issue and what type of evidence should be admitted uh, or can be admitted when a defendant agrees to stipulate to an element. So that case dealt with an evidentiary issue. It had nothing to do with a waiver. To the extent that there's dicta in that case that would indicate that the preferred procedure or that the, the best procedure, best practice would be for the defendant to waive, um, it's just that. It's dicta because that, that issue was not before this court in that particular case. Whereas in the case that I relied upon and that the Court of Appeals relied upon, it specifically dealt with the context of a waiver. Um, more basically than that, our position is that this was not a jury trial waiver. He stipulated to one element of the crime. The jury still had to find him. He still had the jury deciding his guilt on that particular charge. And I went back to see if I had, and it was not an electronic record, so I did not um, find the actual jury instructions. But my, my guess would be that in the jury instruction for that charge, that it listed all of the elements, including the one that the defendant stipulated to. But again, even, even if it did not include that particular element in the jury instruction, the jury still determined his, his guilt on that charge, and there were other elements to, to that particular count beyond just the fact that he had a, a conviction, a prior conviction that would disqualify him from possessing a firearm. The so, jury was still charged with finding that element too. Exactly, and, and, that, and that's why... It's just evidence. Yeah, exactly. The jury could, jurors can do what they want. They could choose to ignore that stipulation. Even if the defendant stipulates to it, they could find for whatever reason that that element has not been satisfied. So um, our position is that the well, court... Of we have case law that says the defendant's stipulation of convicted felon status satisfies the prosecution's burden of proof for that element of the crime. It, it I mean, satisfies I guess the jury can, can exercise its right to nullification. Exactly. I mean, they, they, right. while it's from a legal perspective, while it does satisfy the state's burden, the, the, the jury could nullify. And even if they don't, on, with respect to that particular element, there are still other elements to that crime. So he, he still had a jury deciding his guilt on that issue. And, and as a result, he didn't waive a jury trial. Uh, and so your best argument why Lee should not apply is that the litany of things that should happen is all dicta in Lee. With, yeah, with, at least with respect to everything that is a non-evidentiary part of that, of, of that list. Because again, that was the issue in, in Lee, was whether the court had properly admitted evidence. Whereas in White, the specific issue was the same as what we have here. And that's whether um, there, there needs to be a waiver of a jury trial and somebody agrees to stip. And I would note that in White, it was an even more extreme situation where White he stipulated, the, the stipulation itself said that he was stipulating to each and every element of the offense. So he stipulated across the board to every element of the crime. And even in that case, this court said that a, that a jury trial waiver wasn't necessary. So even more so in a situation where a defendant is just stipulating to one element of a crime, um, I would argue that it's clear that in that context, uh, this was not something that would require a waiver by the defendant. Do we have any further questions? Council, we'll see you on rebuttal. Thank you. Thank you. May it please the court, Sam Shire appearing on behalf of DeQuantreus Johnson. Uh, Your Honor, in the state's petition, uh, the state asserts that there is no basis for concluding that structural error results when a judge sleeps through a portion of a criminal defendant's trial. I believe the Court of Appeals majority opinion thoroughly explains why that is not the case. What I would like to emphasize at argument today is why the majority's holding is a logical and inevitable extension of established United States Supreme Court case law. I'll start out with the fact that the right to a presiding judge is folded in to the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial. A trial without a presiding judge is not a trial within the meaning of the United States Constitution. I would also note 
uh, that the United States Supreme Court has concluded that structural error occurs when a critical phase of trial occurs without a presiding judge. That's United States versus Gomez. Uh, and because uh, that is structural error, I think for there to be any distinction here for the state to say that uh, as the problem implicated by this case is not structural error, this court would need to differentiate an absent judge from a sleeping judge. Uh, and I don't think that there is a basis for doing that uh, because the United States Constitution does not guarantee uh, the right to a person sitting in a judge's bench at the time of trial. It guarantees the right to a presiding judge and a judge cannot preside over trial while he or she is sleeping. A person sleeping is simply sleeping. Uh, so because that's the case, uh, we believe that this case does implicate structural error. Is it a bright line? Asleep, not asleep. Is that a bright line? I, I mean, human experience, well, at least mine, would indicate it might not be such a bright line. I think it is a bright line, Your we Honor. We have different words to describe states of sleep and the particular words here that every, that's admitted is nodding off. Yes, yeah, That's sure. different from deep REM sleep. Well, I, I suppose I don't think you would need to enter REM to be asleep and not presiding. Well, that's what that's gets to the heart of my question, which is, is there some, is there some need for additional facts? In other words, when we conduct a structural error analysis, does it matter the particular, I don't even know how to describe this, but on a spectrum of wide awake to deep REM sleep, does it matter where we are on that spectrum? Because someone can nod off by, you know, people nod off when they're driving and, and that's dangerous, but it, it oftentimes doesn't result in a crash. Um, it could be instantaneous. It could be, uh, you know, eyelids get heavy. My eyelids were heavy. That's a that's perhaps even further on the spectrum towards awake. Well, Your Honor, I guess two responses. The first is I do think nodding off is not presiding. When you're nodding off, even if you're not entering into a full deep sleep, you're not presiding over a trial. Uh, the second thing I would note is that the Court of Appeals panel determined that the record demonstrated that the judge fell asleep uh, in this case. And as I read the state's petition for review, they're not contesting that finding of error. Uh, what they're saying is that the error is not structural. So I'm not sure that that, that continuum issue that, that you're bringing up is, is before this court at this petition stage. The continuum would matter if we said structural error is the wrong test and it's subject to harmlessness, and then you might consider how long they're asleep. Some of the things we discussed with your opposing counsel, how long, how deeply snoring that made it obvious to everybody in the courtroom, et cetera. Yes. But that only comes in if we decide it's not structural. I believe that's correct. Well, there's another way it could come in, and that is if we follow your analogy to an absent judge. I mean, there's a factual question, it seems to me, at root in that analogy, because the level of sleep seems to me to matter a lot, uh, or at least potentially, when you make the analogy to an absent judge. Well, Your Honor, I, I would disagree. And the reason I would say that is because the, the key here is the right to a presiding judge. And I think even if a judge does not enter into a full, complete sleep, He's still not presiding over a trial when he is nodding off. Uh, and I take the phrase nodding off to be synonymous with sleep. Uh, that's what the Court of Appeals uh, viewed it as. And Court of Appeals didn't really address this question. Well, they determined that the judge fell asleep, which I think is supported by the record. Well, they, they didn't determine anything, did they? They're not a fact finder. The record says what it says, and it says the judge admitted that he nodded off, and that's about it. That's all we have in the record. Yeah, well, we have the juror uh, speaking to the bailiff, stating that the judge fell asleep. Saying he appeared, the juror said appeared, that the judge fell asleep, and then the judge to fall asleep, right? 
admitted that he nodded off right. some. Okay. It's his own words. So I think the record does show sleep. That's what the Court of Appeals determined, and I, I don't think the state is taking issue with that in its petition. You, you want us to analogize the sleeping judge with the absent judge. What about the distracted judge? Under your rationale, you have a right to a presiding judge that's awake and aware but what about the distracted judge that's on the phone or watching and, and uh, uh, isn't prepared to rule on objections? And where does that fit into your, to it, your constitutional right for a presiding judge? That could hypothetically, like for example, if the judge is playing solitaire from the bench and, and not paying attention to any of the surroundings, I would imagine that would rise to the level of structural error as well, because the judge isn't presiding. Let's not make it that frivolous. Um, a judge is doing legal research on a question that the judge thinks might come up in a little bit and is busy in Westlaw on their computer on their desk and isn't and is missing what's going on between uh, examining counsel and a witness. Well, that's that's got to be the same thing. I don't think that example would be Why? not presiding over. Well, because the judge is, is doing legal research for... But the actions here, the prejudice or any problem would be here in the question and the answer. That's the same thing as a distracted judge playing solitaire, which you were willing to throw a flag on. Well, I, and I think these hypotheticals that this court would come up with as far as what would constitute a judge who was so distracted uh, that he wasn't presiding over trial... It, those are hypotheticals that really just aren't implicated by this case. I disagree. I think yeah, that they absolutely implicate the whole notion of whether anybody's hurt, whether there actually is any, you know, any real uh, substantive problem here. It's not right, sure, but does anybody get hurt? And in this case, you can look at the record and make some judgments about that. So, well, but it just, but all I'm trying to do is move it from structural over to prejudice that needs to be probed. I'm, I'm, I, you were taking some exception to hypotheticals. I, I can give you a real life example, obviously it's not in the record, but there was a trial judge, not from Kansas, luckily, who uh, gave an interview and said, I pay no attention to what goes on during the jury trial because I rely upon the lawyers to make an objection if something is amiss, and then I'll rule on the objection. Otherwise, I'm doing other things on the bench, legal research, etc. So to follow up on Justice Pyle's question, would that be loss of a presiding judge, and therefore that structural error? It would at least be a debatable proposition, Your Honor. The judge is at least awake to... I'm not sure what would be minimally constitute a presiding judge. I'm, I'm not sure where that line is. I would just submit that sleeping judge is well on the, on the side of the line of constitutional error. Uh, a sleeping judge isn't presiding. Uh, and it makes no difference how long it happened to kind of dovetail with what Justice Steele was asking. I, I don't think the duration matters because when we look at structural errors, it, their errors that affect the framework of trial. And what this court observed uh, over 100 years ago in State versus Berman is that without a judge, there is no trial. So the error in this case, I think, is the quintessential example of a structural error. Uh, this is not just affecting the framework of trial. There just is no trial while the judge in this case was asleep. Uh, and I don't see any way that that can be remedied. That's just a structural error. So your position is duration doesn't matter. 15 seconds, 30 seconds, that's sufficient to create a structural error in the trial. Yes, I believe so, Your Honor. Uh, why, and the other why, thing... Why couldn't that be cured if, if it were uh, if it were a small part, uh, say, voir dire, um, and uh, why couldn't the judge say, okay, I'm, I'm directing counsel, let's go back, I want you to repeat uh, your voir dire over the last 15 minutes? 
would that cure it? No, I don't think that would cure it. Um, one possibility would be to get a jury trial waiver directly from the criminal defendant. Uh, and I do want to touch on that because that touches on the state's invited error argument. Um, but in this case, uh, after the judge uh, made a record that he nodded off, uh, he invited defense counsel to file a motion for a mistrial. Uh, he didn't indicate which way he was going to rule on it, but invited the filing of the motion. And defense counsel declined to move for mistrial. Uh, nobody ever asked Mr. Johnson if he was okay with the fact that his judge had slipped through the first day of his trial. Nobody asked Mr. Johnson if he wanted a mistrial. Uh, and so when we consider the constitutional issue at right in this case, which is the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial, I don't think that that is a right that Mr. Johnson's attorney could waive on his behalf. Uh, it's a matter of black law constitutional law that jury trial waivers must come directly from criminal defendants. Uh, it's not trial strategy. It, this is not the usual kind of uh, defense attorney declines a mistrial uh, issue. Um, this is not an evidentiary issue. This cuts to Mr. Johnson's fundamental right as to whether he is going to choose to exercise his right to a jury trial within the meaning of the Sixth Amendment. Uh, and so I don't believe that the state's structural, or pardon me, the state's invited error argument would be persuasive even if this court were to find that the error in this case was non-structural. Uh, and then with regard to harmless error, very briefly, I would note that in the state's brief, uh, before the Court of Appeals, there was never a harmless error argument that was actually made. Uh, the state did not make that argument in its brief. So that non-briefing of the issue, in my view, uh, amounts to waiver. So I would think that even if this court found that the error in this case was non-structural, it would still be compelled to reverse, uh, affirm the reversal of Mr. Johnson's conviction. Because of the abandonment of the harmlessness argument. Uh, Never. Could you repeat the... Because of the abandonment of the harmlessness argument. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. And I would also note that we did address harmless error in our brief, and we provided arguments why this would not be harmless error. Um, so uh, that being the case, uh, I would respectfully ask this court to affirm the ruling of the Court of Appeals. Did you have anything further to say about the second issue? Uh, I would like to move into the second issue very briefly, Your Honor. And I would just say that in State versus Lee and State versus Mitchell, this court set out a procedure for accepting a felon status stipulation. And that procedure very clearly indicates uh, that a trial judge is supposed to get a jury trial waiver of the state's burden of proving that particular element. Uh, so that procedure wasn't followed in this case. So the question really is whether that procedure that this court set out in Lee and in Mitchell is just a recommendation for what judges need to do or whether it's an actual constitutional mandate. Uh, and I believe it's an actual constitutional mandate uh, because a defendant surrenders his right to a jury trial when he stipulates to an element of an offense. Uh, that's uh, supported by the State versus Smith uh, opinion in our brief uh, and petition. Uh, that's a Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals case. Uh, which equated an elemental waiver with surrender of the right to a jury trial on that particular element. Uh, and I think that's exactly what the Lee and Mitchell courts had in mind when they created this procedure for district courts to follow, which requires them to obtain a waiver of the right to a jury trial. So uh, I would respectfully ask this court to reverse that particular aspect of the Court of Appeals's opinion. Do you have any further presentation? I do not at this time, Your Honor. Any more questions? I just, just one. I think it's a short one. Were there any, we had cross petitions for review and we're here on those questions. Were there any questions that you raised in your initial appeal that the Court of Appeals never got to? A number, yes, Your Honor. What happens with those? Let's say you, you lose here. What happens to those claims of error? I assume you had other claims of error. I think you did, actually. Yes. Uh, 
So I, I do want to break that down. If this court were to find rule against us on the first issue on the petition and, and rule on the second issue however it wished, it would still be compelled to affirm the reversal of the criminal discharge conviction. That's a holding of the Court of Appeals that the state did not Didn't petition. Appeal. Right. Uh, they found reversible error and non-instruction on the last I'm asking about the issues you may have raised, which the Court of Appeals never reached. Yes, and those would need to go back to the Court of Appeals. Okay, so uh, was that raised in your petition for review? Or is that uh, just in a... I did not request remand, but those issues, uh, the Court of Appeals did not err. Right, they just didn't get to it. They just didn't get to them. So I, I think this case, case would need to go back. For those issues. Because For otherwise issues. you would never have you would never have had an appellate review of those issues. That's right, Your Honor. I would note that the state actually has conceded error for one of those issues. Um, so it would be very important for us to get this case back into the Court of Appeals. Thank you, Counsel. Counsel, just really quick, because I just asked the question, yeah. does the state object to what the defense just said, which is those issues which the Court of Appeals never reached, even if you win, w need, need to be addressed by the Court of Appeals? Your Honor, I know that over the past couple of years, we as the state have been filing a lot of, whether they're cross petitions or conditional petitions or just flat out petitions, we've been filing more in those types of situations than we had in the past because our understanding is that if you want the court to rule on an issue, you do have to petition that and say that as an alternative grounds for relief, the court should have addressed the merits of these issues and ruled in our favor on those. So um, I, I think my understanding, uh, the way this court has been applying the rules of appellate practice recently is that if the defense did one of those issues to be preserved or ruled on, that it was the defendant's obligation to include those in his cross petition. Counsel, I'm not trying to tell you how to handle your remaining time, sure. but I'm hoping that you'll address the uh, argument raised by opposing counsel about the state did not ever raise the harmless error argument. Sure, and I, that, that's one of the four points that I have here to address. Um, as you review my brief in this case, what I did was argue that uh, that it was subject to harmless error, harmless error analysis, and then I argued that because the defendant had failed to designate a record showing prejudicial error, uh, that, that he had failed to do so, that there was no way... Uh, so essentially, while it's the duty of the state generally to show that any error that occurred is prejudicial, that is somewhat limited when their defendant has failed to designate a record showing prejudicial error. And as I argued earlier on my, in the initial portion of my argument, a big portion of our argument in this case is that the defendant did not designate a record that would allow this court to determine whether there was prejudicial error. Uh, and when he fails to do so, then I think automatically, essentially, the error does become harmless. But I think if you look at the way that I briefed that in my original brief to the Court of Appeals, it's not that I did not address harmless error at all. I simply argued that based on the state of the record, that it was not, uh, that there's really no way to fully go through and engage in the analysis the way that a court, an appellate court generally would. It looks to me like on the electronic stuff. I never can tell what page I'm on. But the top of page 10 of your Court of Appeals brief, yeah, you talk about that the record demonstrates where the supposed nodding off may have occurred and that there was only a lone objection lodged. And, right. Uh, you know, and so, yeah, so I, I, I mean, you've, you've done something. Yes, yes. And, and I certainly, and that, and that is another one of the points that I wanted to make here is that even though we don't know exactly when on that afternoon and for exactly how long he fell asleep, even if, we know that there were certain periods where he was awake. We, we know that he ruled on the one objection that was lodged. We know that he did admit evidence, exhibits into evidence. So we know that he was awake at those points. Even if one wanted to presume that for every other second of that afternoon he was asleep, which I clearly don't think that the record would support that, but even if you were to presume that, you would be faced with a record where you know that nothing 
prejudicial happened during those portions because we have a transcript. We know everything that happened. We know exactly what testimony was offered. We don't have to speculate. You know, the defense at one point in their brief says, well, maybe something unusual happened. Well, that this is a court. The wasn't there possibility a... of prejudice from just seeing the judge sleeping. And, and also, the... wasn't there a, ju- a motion for acquittal? Didn't the judge have to, well. Not, I mean, that, maybe... not on that day. Well, no, but how do you make a, a ruling on the sufficiency of the evidence if you haven't heard the evidence? And I think that also weighs in at jury instruction time. How do you determine whether or not lesser included defenses, for example, might be appropriate if you haven't heard the evidence? Well, and again, this is this is where we go back to the fact that we're now assuming, and, and I, I did for the sake of argument, but again, our position is that you shouldn't do that. You shouldn't just assume that he was asleep. The whole counsel just now said something about it's, it's structural error to have a Nobody asked the defendant whether he was okay with the fact that the judge slept through the first day of trial. The judge didn't sleep through the first day of trial. We know that the judge was awake. We understand your factual point. And, and as to the other concern about the uh, judgment of acquittal, and this was my third point that I wanted to make, we know this court's case law is that a sleeping juror is, is not structural error. My position would be that if the very 12 people who are deciding the most important thing in a criminal case, guilt or innocence, if a juror can sleep through evidence, and that is not structural error, I would submit that clearly it should not be structural error when a judge does. Because while a judge clearly has an important role in the trial process, he or she is not the one who ultimately is determining whether this person is found guilty. And if we can look at a record and say, okay, a juror slept, but it wasn't prejudicial, or it was, or whatever it turns out to be, the same should apply here. I'm glad that you brought that up because I wanted to ask a couple questions about that. The, the um, precedent that you cite on the sleeping jurors, those cases actually discussed whether structural error would be applied as opposed to just assumed harmlessness would be applied? I cannot remember that well enough to answer one way or the other. Okay, well, that uh, we can look up. Sure. Um, did they talk about, um, or do you have any idea whether they had anything to do with how long the juror slept, what the evidence was of the juror sleeping? You know, it seems to me that I remember one where somebody thought a juror might have, but it was very, whereas here we've got a situation where a juror comes forward and then the judge acknowledges that something happened where I think in those jury cases, I'm not sure we ever had that. Do you know? I, I, I'm not going to be able to give you a specific case off the side, top of my head. I, I do feel like there are cases where it was not so much in question about whether a juror had fallen asleep. It was more along the lines of for how long and during what portions of okay. the trial. Okay, um, and I think the, the one final point that I wanted to make that I wrote down is that counsel started his argument by saying that in order to not find this structural error, this court would have to distinguish between an absent judge and a sleeping judge. And my response to that would be, this court has already done that numerous times. And I've cited them in brief, and uh, Judge Boozer did. Numerous times in the civil context, this court has addressed the error of a sleeping judge. numerous or two? And they're pretty old, right? Uh, well, there were uh, they are old. Yes, they are, they are old. But yeah. there, it was at least two civil cases. And then in the Bowerman, the criminal case, while it was dicta because the court ultimately found that there were other errors requiring reversal, when you read the court's opinion there, it certainly indicates that the Bowerman court was going would have required prejudice uh, with respect to the sleeping judge issue had it not found the other errors. Because I think the language there was it, it does not require much prejudice to get a conviction reversed for a sleeping judge. So our position is that this court has repeatedly distinguished between a sleeping and absent judge and that numerous federal and state courts have made that distinction. And just to summarize, my very last point here is that our position is that structural error is rare and it should be reserved for situation in which it truly is not possible to evaluate whether prejudice occurred. And he, this is simply not one of those circumstances. If a proper record is made, we can determine exactly how long a judge was asleep and what happened during that portion of the trial. And we can determine conclusively 
that no, this was not prejudicial. The judge fell asleep for five seconds while the defense attorney was walking back to chambers to get a witness. Nothing happened. That's not prejudicial. On the other hand, if the record shows that the judge slept for 30 minutes during critical testimony, then obviously in that situation, we as the state would have a very difficult time showing that it was harmless. But the point is that analysis can be engaged in when the proper record is developed by the appellant. Because that was not done in this case, we would respectfully ask you to reverse the Court of Appeals majority on that issue and to affirm the defendant's convictions. Thank you, Counsel. Thank you. We thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.